Who here, can I get a show of hands? Who here thinks they're creative? Oh, hesitation. Um, can I get another show of hands? Who, who thinks they're not or believes that they're not? Oh, some people are undecided. So I think creativity is a little bit of a buzzword at the moment. And my hope is that I'm going to be able to debuzz it somewhat. Uh, and for those of you who uh, believe that you're not creative, I'm hoping I can change your mind about that. Now, there's a couple of reasons why I think that creativity is a little intimidating to people. In our society, people seem to dissociate themselves from the idea of creativity. Um, I think it's something that society has, has decided that we either have or we don't. And that's ridiculous. That's absolutely ridiculous. I believe that creativity is inherently within all of us. It's a huge part of our human experience. It just takes time and it takes practice. Now, one reason that I think we've dissociated ourselves from creativity or why it's intimidating to people is that people confuse the idea of creativity with an artist. Now, an artist, pe people often say, oh, I'm not creative. I wish I was creative. I can't draw, I can't paint, I can't sing. Now, those are people working within the arts, people working uh, through artistic mediums. Creativity is bigger than that. A question I get asked a lot is, why puppetry, Jess? Why puppets? Um, and a huge part of it for me is the accessibility of the art form. Puppetry is non-gendered. Puppetry is available to any age, young or old. Puppetry, you don't have to have a certain level of ability. You don't have to have a certain amount of money. Puppets are very accessible. What defines, uh, what should or can be a puppet is very broad. It's an incredibly broad concept. Um, when I was at university here in Melbourne, I had a class in uh, set design and costumes. I was studying theatre. The class was actually called Alternative Spaces, so it was a little bit abstract. Now, in Alternative Spaces, on our first day, we walked into class, it was a huge space, and our lecturer had strewn materials all over the room. So calico, bamboo, newspaper, wire, string. And we walked in on day one and he just said, make stuff. Go. And we all stared at him blankly and went, what? excuse me, more guidance, thanks. And he was like, no, make stuff, go, sets, props, costumes, I don't care, make stuff. And then we all launched in and once we connected with this idea, it was on. We were sticking things together, trying things out and I walked up to my lecturer and I said, could I make a puppet? And he was like, of course, go for it. And over the next two hours, I created something from nothing. I created this cardboard dinosaur. It was on strings. Looking back now, it was quite a terrible puppet. But for a first try with no guidance and having no idea what I was doing. At the end of the class, we sat down for the last 20 minutes and, and we were asked to reflect. How did this process make us feel? What did we learn? Now, something that I learned was that this exercise was, was so freeing. It was the first time in an educational setting that I had been given that kind of creative freedom. And I think part of why it was so freeing was that there was no stakes. The stakes were so incredibly low. This task was not for anything. There was no assessment. There was no exam. We're not making the costumes to fit an actor. We're not making the props to suit a certain script. There are no stakes. This was about the process. It was about the trying and the doing. Moving uh, ahead, a few years later, uh, I'm studying at the London School of Puppetry. And at LSP, they teach us both puppetry performance and puppet making. Now, part of our puppet making component, they put a huge emphasis in our design. They encourage us to make a mock-up. Now, a mock-up is basically a 3D blueprint. 
of the puppet that will be. We use really raw materials like newspaper, masking tape, cardboard. We put things together, see how are they going to connect, what's going to move, how am I going to operate it, what's going to work and what won't, what will the challenges be. And I found the process of building these mock-ups incredibly therapeutic. It's meant to be quick, it's meant to be rough, it's meant to look a bit unfinished. But more than that, this puppet was not for anyone but me. This was a private piece of art. This puppet didn't need to be seen by my tutors, my fellow students, anyone but me. It only served me and my creativity and my design. I think the perception of success around creativity is often on that end result, is on the beautiful picture, is on the lovely song. Uh, like in Richard's uh, talk, uh, the, the students focusing on the drawing, the pen and the paper, rather than the outcome. On top of that, I would always fall in love with my mock-ups. Uh, I would find something so incredibly engaging about these simple paper and tape creations that quite often I wouldn't want or need to create the final puppet. I would be like, this is so beautiful and engaging on its own. Why would I need to create anything more permanent? And what that taught me about puppets is that a puppet's power is not in its appearance. A puppet's power is in its movement. A puppet doesn't have to be pretty. A puppet doesn't have to be permanent. Nothing is permanent, let's be honest. Now, I'm home from the London School of Puppetry. I'm back in Australia. And I've decided, I, you know, I'm going to be a professional. I'm trained now. I'm, I'm going to be a professional puppeteer. How do I do that? Now, one, one thing I decided to do was that I was going to share. I was going to share this art form that I love so much. I decided to go into schools and, and teach about puppetry. Now, because I'm a professional, I think I'm going to do this in a really structured way. And I start teaching uh, really, really formulaic puppet-making classes. Everyone's given the same materials, A, B, C, D. Step one, join A to B. Take your bottle top and connect it to this piece of string and step two, join C to D and D to E and at the end we all have the exact same puppet. Now, that's a nice puppet. That's cute. Um, kids were happy. They've all got a lovely puppet at the end. It's fun. But there wasn't much value beyond that. And for me, it wasn't particularly inspiring. For me, it was very repetitious, very monotonous, and in fact wasn't encouraging kids to express their own creativity. It was teaching them to copy mine. So I looked back on my time uh, at university in that room full of calico and bamboo, and I said, that's what I need to be doing. That, that's what I need to be doing. And I thought, what would happen? What would happen if I went into a classroom and I threw rubbish all over the floor and I let the kids go wild? What would happen? Two years ago, I founded a company called Trash Puppets. Now, at Trash Puppets, we do puppet making workshops. You guessed it, we make puppets out of trash. <laughs> it's kind of in the title. Now, imagine we're in a classroom of 40 kids. There's 10 kids at the front holding garbage bags. On the count of three, they're going to tip rubbish all over the floor. One, two, three. And then we let them launch at it. And the teachers' faces, quite often, oh, my God, what have they done? 
because chaos is frightening. <laughs> but we're big advocates of chaos. Now, chaos and play come under the banner of creativity. What a wonderful way to discover your creativity, through chaos and play. Now, a huge part of what school is teaching us is to be compliant, well-behaved adults. Put your hand up, stand in line, ask politely, wait your turn. That's all very important. But I think there's a lot of value in defiance. Now, there was a young boy uh, at a school during a workshop and he came up to me, we've just done our big introduction, the kids have launched at the trash, it's all going really well, and this young boy about seven years old walks up to me and says, I can't do it, Jess. I can't do it. It's too hard. I'm not going to be able to make a good puppet. It's too hard. I'm not going to do it. And I said to him, how about instead of trying to make the world's best puppet, why don't you just try and have as much fun as you possibly can? And he went, okay. And so he jumped in and he started rummaging in the trash and finding things and being like, look at this, and sticking them together and looking at his friends and talking about what they were making. And at the end, he did have a beautiful puppet. It was awesome. But I wouldn't have cared if he'd had nothing. If he had made nothing at all, that would not have been a failure because he had tried and he had played and he had explored because it is in the process, that is where the value lies. We actually send a waiver home uh, with kids before our workshop saying that if your child does not come home with a functional puppet, that is not a failure. Because parents are not in the room with us. They don't see that exploration. They don't see that play. They don't see the discovery. Sometimes a child will have something that in their eyes is the world's greatest puppet and they go home and their mum goes, what is that? And that's horrifying because a moment ago they thought that was the greatest puppet on earth. Now, the trash pile itself is, for me, a good metaphor. So the trash pile, kids finding puppets within that trash pile, or adults, we work a lot with adults as well, is it's about using the resources that you have. Now, we've worked with thousands and thousands of people in the last few years across a wide range of communities. We've worked with schools, festivals and events, corporate spaces, teachers, PDs. Uh, and what we've found is that it's, it's an incredibly unifying task. Now, they're rummaging in the trash, trying to find what they need to create their puppet, what they think they need. And what often happens is someone will come up to you and say, I've got this plastic spoon, I need three more just like it to give my puppet four spoon legs. And all I can say to them is, I can't guarantee there's three more spoons. It's just what's there. You've just got to use what's there. Now, we're obviously a company with a focus on sustainability. We teach about waste management, recycling, right? We're very passionate about that. We're also passionate about economic sustainability, social sustainability. Now, using what we have in the trash pile, if I'm looking at an issue we have around environmental sustainability and I go, what we really need to fix this problem is three more spoons. But we don't have three more spoons. Oh, well, better give up. We need to be thinking differently. We need to be looking at what we do have and using those tools to find new creative solutions to our issues. Because it turns out maybe our puppet didn't need legs at all. Maybe it needed wings. Maybe it needed tentacles. The entrepreneurs of the future, the leaders of tomorrow, are going to be thinking differently. If we want to make any positive changes in our world, we're going to be thinking differently. Now, on top of all of that, let's be honest, puppets are cool. Yeah. Puppets are just really cool, aren't they?
Now, for me, the magic of puppetry is that right there. You know this is just newspaper and trash. That's right. That's right. You know it is. But for a moment, for a brief moment, you suspend your disbelief. There is a brief moment for just a second, a millisecond, where your mind thinks it's real. And you connect with it. And for me, that's the magic. That's the magic of puppetry. Now, a puppet doesn't have to be pretty. A puppet doesn't have to be permanent. Good girl, yes. So if I can give any advice today, if I can give you any action moving forward, trying to discover your own creativity, it's go make stuff. Thank you.